Awaken Sober Podcast, a podcast about life and recovery through Christ. Thank you guys for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. If you're new, welcome. Those of you who have been listening for a while, thanks for joining us once again. we got a great show for you today. We have a special guest. Uh, what was his name again? Burks. Burks, yes. Burks. His name is Brent. Brent. Brent will be joining us today. So we'll get the party started, man. Pastor Shane, how's your week been, bro? Hey, it's it's been a week. It's been fun. Um, we cleared out a lot of space at the building for Reclaiming Hope this week. Nice. Um, emptied a whole bunch of drywall, mopped 3,200 square foot worth of floors after we got the drywall out, all the metal framing out. Wow. And so now we got a lot of work to do to put it all back together, um, start building a couple walls, bringing in furniture and that. But um, it's, it's going, man. It's looking good. That's great. And I'm super excited because I know we want to bring testimonies in or people's stories at least once a month, once every four weeks. And uh, I'm pretty excited about the man that we have sitting with us today, Brent. Brent, man, how are you doing, brother? I'm doing well, doing well. Steal one out of your book. <laughs> Still not in my book, huh? I am well. So um, it is what also makes me excited about having Brent here is he, he does one of my favorite things, and we won't talk about it now. We'll talk about it later when okay. he gets to it. But, but he lives that to the fullest, and, and so I really love it. So he he plays pickleball? He plays pickleball nice. to the fullest. <laughs> if he don't, he will whenever he gets back in our area. That's for sure. So, yeah, Derek, how are you doing? How is it with your soul? Well, I man, I gotta say, my soul is good for just the little things that's been going on and stuff. My life is really good. I feel I feel that my faith being tested, but it, to me, it's a positive thing. Mm. You know, I'm feeling better and stronger about myself the more I'm giving and letting go and giving God in my recovery, not just of the drugs and alcohol, but in life itself, the full recovery of life. Yeah, we grow in that that uncomfortability. Yes. We grow through those challenges and the trials, the tribulations, because we got to lean on God. Not our power, His power. So I understand. Not our timing, His timing. Not our will, His will. All that good yeah, stuff. Yeah, it's, it's not fun, though, is it? <laughs> it's not, but I'm okay. I'm, I have joy. Good. Still today, I have joy, and I'm okay with it. And we got somebody new sitting down here with us. He's not on camera. Don't have a mic, but he's helping us over on the soundboard, um, kicking it his first time. And and the bad thing is that we don't even have a set of headphones, so he can't even really hear everything. I mean, he could hear us, but he couldn't hear when we were doing what, and he did an excellent job. Steve, thank you, my brother. Good to have you. I'm glad that you're here with us. Since we're bringing him in, we got to talk about the two who are not here today. Oh, the slackers. No. One, we got going to the CR Summit, so power to him for doing his services and that. And then the other one's with family. And as we all know, family comes right after your God, God, wife, family, right? Yes. So well, yeah, that's he's, true. But he's doing his thing. But I'm just saying, California shouldn't count. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, he keeps teasing me because the first thing he's going to do is step off the plane, go get his his rental car, and go straight to In and Out. He's going to get a double-double animal style right that's a, away. That's a burger place, Bert, in case you didn't know. <laughs> in my, my personal opinion, it's a little overrated. A little overrated. Oh. See, I did like Brent all the way up until now. Right. <laughs> Maybe you just haven't had it done right for you. He, he's a Whataburger guy. I am a Whataburger <laughs> See, guy. Yeah. Oh, man. Bigger burger. More meat. Yeah. Mm, See, taste. It, it's, it's all, all about, about the, the flavor. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to have to take you to in and out and I'm going to have you order it. You know, we'll, we'll get you a, a, even a three by three animal style with uh, the peppers on it. Ooh, Ooh yeah. yeah. I'm telling <laughs> you, you'll enjoy it. I promise you the flavor will be there and you would be like, oh yeah, Whataburger, what? What, what? Don't want none of that. So, we'll see. We'll see. We'll go from Whataburger to a whatchamacallit burger. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to have some fun. We're going to get started with Brent's story. Um, since, of course, we got started a little late today. So, Brent, tell us a little bit. Where were you born and raised? Uh, born and raised in St. Charles, Missouri, as my dad likes to call it, Charlie Town. Charlie Town. So, yeah. That's an Illinois place. <laughs> yeah. Charlie Town. <laughs> so, you were born and raised in Charlie Town. Religious upbringing, spiritual upbringing. What did that look like? Yeah, I have uh, grew up in the church. I know uh, my mom and dad always tell me I was a really good baby. I used to go to church, sleep through the organ, 
whole entire time I was playing. Grew up Methodist, but uh, went through went to church, and I mean, I don't think I loved it as a kid. I kind of just went because my parents had me go. I liked vacation Bible school, like playing kickball when we got to go there, but parents were really involved in the church. Yeah, I bet you they were. How long were you in St. Charles? Did you stay over here your, your entire life? So I was in St. Charles until I graduated high school, went down to Springfield, Missouri for college, and then uh, came back here to St. Louis for law school, and now I'm in Chesterfield. Well, right now I'm in Herman, Missouri, but live in Chesterfield. I bet you we'll get to that shortly. So what was your, your childhood like? Brothers, sisters, um, give me, give me about, give me some family dynamics or our listeners, give them the family dynamics of what your family was like, what it was like growing up for Brent. Yeah. So, um, I'm the baby, the only boy. I got three older sisters, so they're all going to say that I'm the favorite. Um, Definitely a mama's boy. Uh, we're all really close, I would say. Not so much growing up. I would fight a lot with my youngest sister and the other ones. They were kind of too old, off doing their own thing. But we were still close. And I would say as we grew, clo- as we grew older, we definitely grew closer. And we're still close to this day. We still go on family vacations. My mom loves having everybody back home under her roof cooking dinner. It's always, it's always been a really tight knit family, I would say. And that's a very important thing to my mom. What's your kitchen table look like at your mom's house? Uh, it's, it's, it's quite the scene. It's a very, very big table. We got, and I think at this point I have, it's probably 12 people total. I got, I think eight nieces and nephews now, I would say. Yeah. Eight nieces uh, and nephews all from newborn baby a couple months old all the way up until 10 years old so yeah i've been around kids since i was 18 my sister had her first kid go ahead i was gonna say yeah his family's pretty close i remember one time him coming in to uh, celebrate recovery and he was joking around with the with a woman i never met the woman before so, right so i'm like who's uh who's brent's little friend Right, and his mom's like that was his sister, and I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> yeah. And and the reason why I asked for you guys because he didn't really paint a picture of this table. When he says his mom likes having the family there, this kitchen table can fit how many people? Oh uh, yeah, I mean it holds a, it holds the whole family definitely. It is <laughs> it is such a big, beautiful kitchen table. I mean, you feel at home whenever you walk in there, you sit down at the kitchen table because the whole family can be there. Nice. In in my house, you gotta you gotta eat in like different rooms. <laughs> you know, three at the kitchen table, four at the other kitchen table. We put some kids downstairs in the playroom. You know, you, we got them all over at Brent's house. You could just sit at the kitchen table. Yeah, and that's that's been true. My whole entire life, we I always remember sitting down and having a family meal with all my sisters up until when one went off to college, we were still having a family meal, three three of us, and then there was two of us, and we kind of started not doing it as much, and then it was just me, me and the folks, and so we moved over and kind of sat at the bar and watched TV while we ate, but we always ate dinner together every single th- every single night, I would say. Wow. I'm just trying to think what that would be like. Yeah, I mean, we, I mean, four kids. There's no way my mom. His mom's gonna invite us over for dinner so we can actually get that feel. Because it's been a while. <laughs> I don't know if she'll let you in the house. His mom loves me. <laughs> <laughs> we always go out to eat whenever I'm, whenever I'm with, with Brian and Nadine. We always just go out to eat somewhere. Um, usually it's El Magui's. Yeah, they That's love that place. Spot. They, they, will, they will eat that place until the day they die. So sports, were you, did you play sports? Did you just sit by and watch sports? What was it like? Yeah, I grew up playing sports my whole entire life. Um, I played three sports, football, baseball, and basketball. Uh, all three of those up until my sophomore year of high school. And then after that, dropped football and uh, basketball and just continued playing baseball. Um, went on and played baseball in college for a year but yeah i mean i love sports that's one thing that i played my entire life very competitive i never really had that never really pushed from mom and dad and those 
mom and dads were screaming in the crowd, yelling at their kids, yelling at the coaches. I was never them. They were just always sitting back, just kind of letting me do my thing, letting me dictate what I wanted to do. Mm. That's pretty cool. Any, I was going to say, um, anything else from the childhood that we should know? Um, I would say, yeah. I mean, one of the big things growing up, I would say, was, I mean, should I go ahead and talk about that? Hey, you can talk about whatever you want, unless you want to talk about the first drink first. Yeah, let's let's go to the first drink, and I'll 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 backtrack to that. So, how old were you when you had your first drink? Uh, first drink was, I was in seventh grade, so I would have been thirteen years old. Yeah, 13 years old, and uh, it was on Halloween night, I remember, at uh, one of my friend's house. We uh, got one of his older brothers to buy us some beer, and, uh, drank it before we went out trick-or-treating, because, I mean, we were still going out trick-or-treating at that point, and yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm pretty sure it was warm whenever we got it, so I didn't love it, but everybody was doing it. It was, I really never even batted an eye whenever it came down to it to drink. And so after that, did you continue? No, I wouldn't say I continued to drink. I mean, there was just maybe that off and on weekend. If we could go over to that same buddy's house, his parents were never home. No supervision whatsoever. I mean, parents didn't really know that's where we were all going. We would say we were going to one house and we would always wind up at his house. And it was maybe once a month, maybe once every two months I would say and then getting into high school that's whenever it started to take off a little bit more maybe twice a month go over to some parties and really I mean up until college it was very sporadic I would say I my mom kept a pretty close eye on me when I was in high school so she didn't really like she she knew all the tricks having three older sisters she she, she knew she knew whenever i said i would spend the night somewhere what was going to go on so she really didn't love that to happen she she let it slide every once in a while but they were never like those parents who would let me have friends over take everybody's car keys and hey everybody can drink and as long as everybody stays the night they 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 weren't very happy if i was out drinking with my friends i would say that much Good for them. I knew I liked your mom and dad. <laughs> I would never take people's keys either. Well, you're not drinking over here. No. And now my daughter's not going over there or my son's not <laughs> going over there. So um, we try to control a little bit, I guess. And sometimes it works, sometimes it don't. So when would you say that it finally crossed a line for you? Um, I would say... I would say that I started drinking and it became a problem. The way I was drinking and drugging was probably my junior year of college is whenever it became a problem and it was starting to really actually interfere with my life. Um, I had gone down to college to play baseball and right before the my senior year, of high school, I going into my senior year, I had hurt my arm and I got Tommy John surgery and that kind of, that kind of really <clears throat> took the air out of my tires. I, I didn't, didn't see myself ending up at the college that I went to. I thought I was always going to be some division one baseball player, hurt my arm, ended up going down to college out of D2 school. And I just didn't love the game anymore. And Ended up just transferring to Missouri State. I'll just I'll just do the fraternity life, and so that's that's when the drinking and drugging picked up. I would say I was it was kind of disappointed that that one thing that I loved was gone. Kind of I felt like I failed at something. Kind of gave up on it. And at the time, I didn't really think about it. I thought ah, I, I want to have fun, and so I just kind of gave up on it. Looking back and going through college, I I mean I really wasn't taking school seriously at all. All my friends were partying. I was partying, having a fun time. And I thought I wanted to go to medical school. I don't, I don't really even know why I thought I wanted to go to medical school. My whole family was in the health, health field and thought I wanted to go to medical school and I didn't go to class. And so when you don't go to class and you don't go 
don't don't go to your labs. You start <laughs> falling behind a little bit. I mean, they don't let just anybody in medical school. And I was I I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't even think I can do this anymore. So I ended up switching majors and uh, took an aptitude test, something that my dad suggested, and it kind of pointed me into the direction of law school. I was like, all right, yeah, I'll I'll do this. This is what I want to do. But once again, I, I kind of just gave up on that that medical school dream and just was okay with that, I thought. And I just kind of felt lost a little bit and really started to, that was the first time I think I started feeling a little anxiety, a little depression. And I didn't know what it was. I had never really spoken about it with anybody. Nobody really talked about it that much back then, I guess. I mean, that, I say back then, that was a long time ago. I mean, eight years ago. And that was the first time I really started having depression, anxiety. And I found out if I just drank or drugged, got messed up enough, I kind of went away a little bit. And eventually I just, I, I just felt so lost and numb. And I didn't have anybody to talk to. And that's, that's when I feel like I started crossing the line of coping with drinking. And when that wasn't enough, this was actually the first time. I don't really know why I did it. I just, I think I had heard that it helped coping. And so that was the first time I actually self-harmed down in college. And I knew doing that, that was a problem. And so I, I told my parents that and they brought me back home for a semester because they knew something was wrong. And so I was able to... I stopped drinking altogether, stopped doing drugs altogether for probably six months, I would say. And so I, I thought I had control over it. That was that was one thing I think that really ended up hurting me in the long run was that little bout of sobriety and being able to just stop cold turkey like that. That ended up being something that really stuck with me in a bad way, I would say. I, I got a question for you. You said you had Tommy John surgery? Yes, sir. What exactly is Tommy John surgery? Because when I hear Tommy John, I think of something else. But go ahead first. All right, so uh, Tommy John, I don't know if you could see it on camera, but so it's it's your elbow. So when you're throwing, there's a ligament in there. <clears throat> and I ended up tearing that ligament. And so I needed surgery. And the guy told me, he's like, I mean, look, you can go your whole entire life without even having the surgery. You just won't really be able to throw anything. And I still wanted to play baseball at the time. So I actually got Tommy John surgery. It's it's named after a pitcher. And so I got it done by the same guy who works on the Cardinals. So he's done and went in there. He had Adam Wainwright's jersey, Chris Carpenter's jersey. He's done surgery on all those guys. And it was pretty cool. I thought I was a big dog at that point. So so in a way, the dream was shattered, but yet it wasn't shattered all the way at that point. No, no, not at that point. But it it's it definitely wasn't what I expected it to be. So I guess one other question, though, is you can't miss class and go to med school, but if I heard you correctly, you you wanted to go to law side so you can miss class and become a lawyer. I guess I kind of hurt myself on that one. Um, I was <laughs> it's still, it's I was, all right. I just, I just want to mess with you a little I bit. I was able to eke by. I was still able to graduate with an undergrad degree. I just wanted to mess with you so that way I could give some of the lawyers in my life a little trouble. Oh, so you, you got to miss school and still graduate, huh? <laughs> you couldn't do med school, but you could do law school. Yeah, I would say. I get it now. I would say a doctor is probably a little bit smarter than a lawyer. <laughs> I don't know. There's some lawyers that, that yeah, are We're not brilliant. trying to get shut down, so be careful how you say things. <laughs> So let's move back to college just a little bit because you said that you started dealing with uh, the drinking as a coping mechanism. Any other coping mechanisms that started in college? Um, I mean, as I mentioned, self-harm was one of my coping mechanisms I, that I tried to use. I thought, I, I think at the point, at that point in my head, what was going on is I was numbing myself so much with the drinking and the drugging and not talking to anybody and just bottling all that up inside that I couldn't feel anything. And so maybe I thought if I can feel something physical, feel that release, that is something that would, I don't know, help me. And I've, I've never done it since then, just, but it, it, it was just something that popped in my mind. And I was like, I, I don't know what to do right now, man. Like, I can't talk to anybody. I don't know how to talk to anybody. I don't even know what this is that I'm feeling. I just know that I'm not feeling right. 
And so does self-harm only happen in college? Yeah, yeah. That was the only time I actually physically harmed myself. You know, um, and I know we had talked about it before. It's something that you don't hear guys talk about. No, no, it's not something that you hear guys talk about at all. But I think that, and I've talked to my therapist about this before, and I was so ashamed of it. I mean, I am an expert at hiding it. Nobody knows. I mean, I have scars on my arm, but I am so good at situating myself in a room, turning my arm a particular way, because I'm, I'm always thinking about it subconsciously, because I don't want someone to see it and judge me for it. And now I've, I've kind of gotten to the point where I can just kind of own it and just be okay with it. I'm not going around showing everybody it, but I am okay if someone was to ask me about it. I'm okay speaking about it because to me, it, it used to always be a sign of weakness to me. And I, I thought it was made me not a man to do something like that. Mm. And being able to talk about it and show that I was able to get through that and I'm no longer ashamed of it, that shows more strength than it is a weakness. And that's why I just tell myself. And it gets it gets easier and easier. Yeah, it's gonna somebody's gonna hear this, email in and get a hold of us so they could talk to you. And that's that's that gift of going second, right? Mm-hmm. You get to you get to say it to an audience. And now they get to go say it. No longer do they have to hide behind that shame and that guilt from it. They're going to experience freedom because of those words. Mm -hmm. And that's the beautiful thing about when we get to share our story, and especially something like that. Because on a man's side, have you ever heard anything before? Not so much as saying that they were self-harming, but I know uh, that we, I don't know if I say the IV users. Oh, yeah, no. No, that's just, yeah, no, something totally different. Yeah. I mean, I didn't, I wouldn't tell anybody about it at all. I mean, there was for the longest time. So I, that happened when I was 21, I would say up until the age of right now, 29, I would say less than 10 people in my life knew about it at all. And that's including my family, which accounts for a lot of people. Just a few. Yeah. All 300 of them, (laughs) 300 at the the dinner (laughs) table. So you obviously graduated college, became a lawyer, esquire, attorney, barrister, however you want to call it. And you know, it's funny that, you know, when I first met Brent, I had no clue. I had no clue he was a lawyer. Mm -mm. I just thought he was a spoiled brat. (laughs) When I first met him, he had the the baseball cap on, had a t-shirt on, uh, you know, gym shorts. Look, I mean, he looked like he just came off the baseball field, like he just was out practicing. I did not think, no, when I heard he was a lawyer, like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't always have to dress the part. No, that you don't. But your mind is always playing that part. Yes, yeah. My mind is always playing that part. It's always trying to think. Yep. Probably too fast sometimes. And it sometimes gets me in trouble how much I can overthink things. And kind of use my intelligence to hurt myself, I would say, when mm. it comes down to it. So what was the progression like after college for you? Like, when did you realize that you might have a problem? How was that progression? And then we're going to get into a couple other things here in a minute, but I just want to see how it went. Yeah. So, like I said, I didn't, I didn't drink for six months, and I went back down for my senior year in uh, undergrad and I, I went back to drinking, but I wasn't doing what I was doing before. I kind of only only drank and smoked weed every now and again, and I wasn't really doing drugs anymore. And I, I thought I kind of had a handle on the drinking for the most part and graduated, went to law school, and I was like, I'm going to take this thing seriously. I'm going to really buckle down this time because I just really, I feel like I wasted those four years. And so... At that point, I treated it like a job. I was studying nonstop because I wanted to I wanted to be the best. That competitiveness came out again. And so I, I really cut down the drinking a lot. I mean, I would maybe drink on weekends, have a beer at dinner with my family. There's really no alcoholic tendencies anymore. 
And I would say my third year of law school, right around the time COVID's happening, and I get a job that I had. I get that job offer pulled. Um, I'm not getting the, the job opportunities that I thought I would get, that I thought I deserved. And I had worked so hard for that. And how can I not be getting these things? And once again, I feel lost. I feel like I'm a failure. And that's when I would say I, would, I started drinking again. And I know that I was drinking alcoholically because I was doing I was I was doing it alone I was doing it after people had gone to bed and I was doing it when nobody was around and slowly and slowly I noticed that I was I was drinking everything that I had in the house at that time if I if it, if it was there and I had no restraint on me like someone was around to to say hey why are you why are you drinking so much I was going to drink it And so that's whenever it started going off the rails. And I started noticing that it was a problem and I couldn't stop at all. And I didn't think I was an alcoholic. I don't know why, but that term never really came to my head. But I knew something was wrong. And I started feeling depressed again. I started feeling anxious again. And the only thing that I thought was going to help was drinking. So I just kept doing that and doing that. And... I thought there was, I didn't know what to do about it. I didn't know that I could stop and have somebody help me. I didn't realize that I could ask for help from somebody. And I got so deep into a hole that at one point I, I, I just wanted to end my own life. And so I made a plan to do it and decided this, this I thought it, I thought about it. I can't do this. I, this is not something I can do. I, I can't do this to the people that I love. And so I went and got help from my mom and dad and my sisters. And I didn't tell them about the drinking. And so they found out about the drinking once they kind of had a closer eye on me. And they realized that I was drinking a lot. And so that was the first time that someone said, hey, I, I think you need to do something about this. And so I, I did an outpatient program for the first time back in 2020. Then take it seriously. They told me to go to AA. I'm going to AA. I'm not an alcoholic. There's no way I'm doing that. <laughs> and uh, after that, it uh, I, I just, I never was able to drink normally again after that point, ever again. I don't know what that means, but drink normally. <clears throat> Normals are sitting on a dryer. <laughs> That's about it. And I don't even use that. <laughs> so it's it's like delicates maybe or, you know, right. uh, heavy if I got a, a comforter in there, but never normal. That's for sure. Let me ask you before we get into the other things, what do you think are some of the root causes that led to this? Um, I would say one of the biggest things that I know that I did was it wasn't what I did. It's what I didn't do. And that's, I didn't speak up. I didn't tell anybody ever how I was feeling. I was always good. I was going to make sure everybody saw me as having it all together, always happy, can handle everything on my own. And I never wanted to ask for help. And that was one of the things that got me in the biggest trouble was never asking for help my ego was too big I couldn't let anybody see me and when I say my ego was too big I thought asking for help was going to affect my manhood that was the biggest thing so that's a couple times that you've said something about your manhood (laughs) why tell me tell me what would make you worry about your manhood so much yeah, so this is kind of like what I alluded to a little bit in the beginning when I said, should I talk about this? Um, and the, I didn't find this out until just recently doing a four-step, actually, with my sponsor, Shane. And uh, <laughs> well, I guess that kind of ruins that part, huh? <laughs> yeah, Poor right. guy. And uh, I, was, uh, I was looking back in my life, and I, I was, I was kind of thinking, all right, I'm, I think I'm done with this four-step. And I was like, all right. 
someone someone had said something like, if I saw this person again, I would really, that would really tick me off if I saw that. I was like, oh, do I have anybody in like that like that in my past? So I thought back, and there was a coach that I had back when I was little, back when I was six years old, and that's when I started playing football. And he treated us like we were grown men at the age of six, and you're a kid at that age. Football is a very physical sport, and so you're going to cry. You're going to get hit for the first time, and it doesn't feel good. And that's whenever I was first taught, and it stuck with me for my entire life, is you don't cry. Men don't cry. Men don't complain, because I'm not going to use the words that he used, but that makes you X, Y, and Z. And that really stuck with me, and I don't think I knew it stuck with me, but I mean, I would probably say after that, after being, if you cried, you were humiliated. And probably from that age on, I never cried from a physical injury ever again, no matter how bad it hurt, because I wasn't what a man did. And so I was always concerned about saying something, showing that weakness. And well, wait, what did that coach say? That, that makes you a what? I'm not, no, I can't do that. What are they going to think if I say that I'm struggling with something? Do you know what incident he's talking about? The the one that he heard the story about, or the one that he uh no the the one that with the night that he heard a story. Yeah, that was the night, and I think I've shared it here on the podcast before. When I saw an individual that had upset me, but I forgave that person, and it took a load off of my whole what was things that were holding me back in my recovery. It was a big release. But yeah, it was a beautiful thing because it was right after that Friday night at yes, Celebrate sir. Recovery. Me and him are driving around, and we're going down Bento Cutoff. I know if you don't live around here, you don't know where it's at, but a road right around the corner. We're driving, and then that's when we started talking, and <clears throat> he dove into that. And I'm guessing having three older sisters wasn't always good for the manhood. No, no, I wouldn't say that was good for the manhood always. I mean, it, it always worked to my advantage with um, the females. I knew how to treat a woman. I knew... Um, how to be sensitive, I think, with women. But that growing up when you're a teenager and a young adult, that, that's not how guys treat women. That, that's not how they see a man. That's not how a man treats a woman. And Isn't so, that sad? Yeah, it is. Isn't that sad? So pretty soon, whenever you finally start dating again, um, that, that's going to be a lucky woman because yeah. you know how to treat them. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I know that that's that's what makes you a man. A man doesn't come from that stereotypical macho man, me man, you woman, you do these things for me type of deal. Heck no. See, I was going to ask because we come we come from uh, similar nationalities, so I didn't know if that had something to do with the, the whole manhood thing as well. Because in my household, man did not ask for, like you said, didn't ask for help. It was the muchismo that we were supposed to conduct about ourselves. We were never to be weak by no means whatsoever Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I don't know if you was had that same thing in your household as well. No, I wouldn't say that. I guess I just have never really seen my dad ask for help. I'm sure he goes to my, he confides in my mom, but you don't confide. You don't ask for help from your children. And so I, I don't know if my dad ever asked for help. I always see him as having it all together, but I'm sure he's human. He, he has his struggles. He, he asked my mom when he's having his struggles. Oh, I'm sure he does. You got a heck of a dad. You got a heck of a family. Yes, sir. I mean, they, they love you to death. I know you love them to death. And um, mom and dad, I'm proud of them. I can't wait till they come on here because we're <laughs> going to do the same thing with Brian and Nadine. We're going to bring them on here and we're going to sit down and do an interview and they get to talk about the other side of, of being the parents of. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so I think it's going to be good. So how about this? Which one? Has- <laughs> Number eight. Now, right, what was the like the last year, the last month had been in your recovery, in your addiction, when you were starting to recognize that point that you wanted to, um, you, something was going wrong? What was it like? Mm, let me clarify. Just so, would you say? So, I've been trying to do this recovery thing for two years at this point. So, would you say like the last year until this past year, or like even before? No, when I tried you to get when help? you started to recognize that you needed help. Well. He did that a little while back. What was the last year, all the way till today, the last year oh, that, into the last month of your addiction? Oh, 
What was it like? Walk us through that because we already know we've, we've heard some of that progression. Give us, um, and, and I'll ask you a, a few more questions afterwards, but give us that last year. I mean, it was a roller coaster, honestly. And it was a lot of stringing some days together of sobriety and then relapsing, stringing some days together and then relapsing. I mean, I could not get more than 90 days. I got 90 days one time in the past year and all the other times, I mean, I didn't even come close. I mean, there were some days I would get two or three and I would just relapse every single time. And the relapses would get shorter. They wouldn't be as bad, but I mean, nothing was really getting through to me. No matter how many times I relapsed, I mean, I had to, have, I had to get up one time. I mean, you, you've been to my, Derek's been to my house once to come and try to talk to me. Shane's been to my house twice to talk to me. Twice. I came once with Derek, once with a torn up knee jumping over and hugged you while you were naked. And then I, I out to mom and dad's house. So I could tell you I've been out there. I know a lot more than twice. Uh, you had a bum knee and he was naked. I had, I had a bum a, knee. I, I had I was to jump over his balcony up. at his old apartment. Oh, okay. So, and the balcony was not a short balcony. No. no. So I had to Sorry. jump over the balcony in order to sit there and talk to him in 115 degree heat while he's drunk on the couch. Um, at least when he got up, he did cover up with a blanket. But yeah, he was... He was in there. He's like, he didn't want to let me in and he didn't want to even open the door. And I'm like, I promise I won't do it. I'm not going to kidnap you. You're telling right. me you're going to, but I want to check on you. I want to see you and I want to give you a hug before I leave. Yeah. And yeah. I kept my word. You, you kept your word. And I just, I mean, that goes to like, I didn't want anybody helping me. I thought if I just, if I just shut that door and I could just shut you out and shut out the world that those people would eventually stop caring. And I spent a lot of time this last year trying to do just that. And no matter how hard I tried to make people not care. They cared more? They cared more. I would push people away and that just would bring them closer every single time. And it just doesn't work with it. It doesn't work with people that truly love you and truly care about you and want to see you get better. And... I am so appreciative of those people over this last year who loved me when I couldn't love myself. Although I didn't reciprocate that love, that's that's what got me through. And yeah, it wasn't pretty, but it did get me to the point of desperation where I finally did want to get help. And this last time, whenever I decided to go get help and get residential. So when was that? That was um, March of 2023, early March. March 15th is whenever I arrived at Arizona, March 14th. And at that point in time, I, I that relapse had lasted a while. It, it had been going on for a week at that point. And I, I felt like at that point, I had, I had had that feeling before where I wasn't going to be able to stop. And I was just tired of living that constant cycle of, String days together, drink. String days together, drink. I couldn't do that my whole life. I just couldn't. I knew I couldn't do it. I knew I wasn't going to be able to break that cycle unless I removed myself from that environment. And so how'd you, how'd you land on the place that you ended up? How'd you finally decide, I'm going to go to this place? Yeah, so it was a Sunday night. My parents said uh, they were gone all day, and I just drank. I got a bottle from the gas station, just drank all day, and they came home. And that was the first time that they had actually caught me in the act in a while of drinking. Because before that, I was hiding it. And it was just like the next day or a failed truck test, or they had just known I had relapsed. They had found bottles. And... I told them, I was like, I'm just done. I, I got to go somewhere. I have to go somewhere. So that night we got Shane on the phone and I said, look, I, I'm ready. I need, I need to go away again. Cause I had already tried rehab once before that March of 2022. And so it was a year later and I still didn't have it. And so I called Shane. He's like, yeah, I got you, man. Let me, and he stayed up. I'm sure way later than he showed up looking at these places and uh 
he gives me a call the next day. Him and Christina do. And they're like, all right, we got, we got, I think it was three places. Yep. And I, I was, I was thinking I was going to go somewhere here in Missouri. I, I know these people here. I, like, I'll work hard. I want this. And I'll still be comfortable. I still, I'll, I'll be able to maybe see Shane and the people that I know. And they're like, well, here's the deal. These places aren't in Missouri. <laughs> yeah. But I I knew and I trust I didn't know, but I trusted that what they were telling me was what was best for me. And I didn't know at that point what was best for me because everything I was doing was not best for me. It was the exact opposite. So they said, Hey, this place we've been looking at it. It's in uh in tucson arizona it's a really nice place they got a pool they got horses they got all this stuff that you can do i was like all right yeah i'll do it i'll do it well it came down to therapist for me (laughs) because you you would he had access to his personal therapist twice a week and other therapists for other things like trauma therapists and Mm -hmm. equine therapists but he could go see anybody Mm -hmm. it was therapy heavy it was good it was great. But he got to make all the decisions. I mean, you had to, in the end, you had to pick it. It had to be about you. Yeah, yeah, I had to pick it. And my parents were definitely, I think they were a little slower and a little more hesitant than I was to send me away somewhere that far. And in my mind, I thought, I mean, I went to rehab an hour away and I couldn't see anybody. So what's the difference if I go out of state? I still can't see anybody. So what's the difference It's just further away. I got to fly down there. I'm the one who's making the trip and I'm the one who's going to be doing the work. So let's just do the thing. So walk us through a little bit of treatment. Don't, don't give us a day by day, but, but where'd you go? You went Arizona. What happened next? Cause you went there in March, March 14th. Yeah. March 14th. I went down there. And uh, I was like, I'm going to do the 30 days just like I did uh, the last time. I'm going to go back home and probably do some outpatient back home and just jump back right into regular life eventually. And uh, I towards the end of my stay, I mean, I worked hard, went radio silence for probably two weeks um, and just really dug in, focused on myself. And towards the end of that stay, I... Uh, got together with a coordinator and she was like, all right, we're, what are you thinking? I was like, well, I got to go back home. And, uh, so I need, I need outpatient back in St. Louis. She's like, why do you need to go back to St. Louis? I I don't know. I guess I really don't. And so she's like, how about we, how about you try something different? And so I'm going to look at a couple places where there's people more your age and just look around for you and just be open I was like, man, I don't want. I just want to go home, <laughs> go back to my house, see my dog, sleep in my bed, play Xbox, see the people I know. And uh, I winded up. I wound up. She tells me, hey, there's this place in Nashville that I think is really great, and it, we've sent some people there before, and it's it's a great program. And I was like, I gotta run this by Shane and Christina. But I didn't tell them immediately. I I didn't tell my parents immediately. That's what she suggested. And I kind of just thought about it, prayed about it. And that was one of the first times I would say that I actually prayed and asked God, like, hey, is is this what I should do? And actually was willing to listen to what I heard back. And so kind of steered me in the direction of going to Nashville, digging in a little bit more, taking it slower. And I... I called Shane and Christina and my parents and let them know that this was an option. But I think in my mind, I already had that made up. I had already made that next decision for myself. I kind of just wanted that, uh, that, uh, reaffirming by them that this was a good decision. So we knew pretty early Mm -hmm. because his, his team was in contact with us. And that way we could talk through it. And I'm like, oh, man, yes, please. I I just wanted him to go and have fun. Enjoy what recovery can really be about. Because you were the hardest working person I know when it came to recovery. It's not like you weren't doing things to try to make yourself stay stay sober. I mean, you were going to meetings. You were doing steps. you, You were... 
you just couldn't surrender the alcohol side of things. You couldn't get past, you couldn't get out of your own way. No, yeah. but you, you were the hardest working person I know in recovery. It, it was crazy. The things that you were willing to, the links you were willing to go to and didn't stay sober, but you didn't give up. It was perseverance for you. So you did 30 days in Arizona. Then you went to Tennessee. Yeah. I went to Tennessee for another 30 days. And um, and I finally thought I was going to be able to come back home, sleep in my <laughs> own bed, get back to life, and uh, talked it over again with Shane and Christina, and let's do something different that we haven't done before, because we've tried to go back home, and we've tried to get right back into work, and it never works out. It's too fast. And um, Shane told me about this place out in Herman that one of his uh, buddies in recovery runs, and... Uh, it's called Learn to Live. It's out in Herman, Missouri. And it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's like, man, yeah, I'll do it for 30 days. And Shane <laughs> tells me, he's like, yeah, I talked to him, but here's the deal. It's a 90-day commitment. And I was like, mm. <laughs> it's, it's 90 minimum commitment. Right. I was like, yeah, I'll do it. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll get away with 60. And I think by the time, by the time I got there, I was pretty sold on staying the 90 days and it took you a couple of weeks. I, I, I would say it took me a couple of weeks. It I, took you a couple of weeks. You were still, mm. yeah, I was still tiptoeing around a little bit. And I mean, this is just, just an example of how well Shane knows me is I was like, yeah, I, I kind of want to spend like, can, so I leave on Friday. Can I go home on Friday, spend the weekend at my parents' house and then check into this place on Monday I was like, that'll be so I can get some family time, sleep in my bed, see my dog. He's like, nope, we're doing door to door. And uh, I was like, all right, fine, whatever. <laughs> and uh, I had lunch with my mom and dad after getting off the plane. And immediately what was going through my head was, man, I wish I could go home. That'd be so nice. That'd be so nice. And I knew if I went home that Friday, I was not going out to learn to live because it would, I would be too comfortable at home. And learning to get uncomfortable and do something I never have done before and continue to do that has made this recovery so much stronger for me. Mm. Anything? No, I just, you know, I just want to know what has it been like for you since you've actually been working your recovery and your sobriety. How's it been? I mean, it's been, it's been good. I would say that, there's a whole combination of things. And right now, I mean, like I said before, I was I was struggling so hard to get to 90 days. I'm at four months right now, and that's the longest I've ever been. And Congratulations. Thank you. And it hasn't been as hard as I thought it was before. And I think one of the biggest things is I just, I was just sick and tired. And I finally, that desire to drink is finally less than that desire to stay sober. And living in a house with 11 other men who are all doing the same thing, who all want recovery, and I've never had that, that tribe before, that, um, that fellowship, and that's been great to have. That's been great to have those people hold you accountable the whole entire time and just be with people who want the same thing as you. And that's, that's really been good, and I've been just – Taking it slow, taking everything slow. Just when I think I'm ready for something, backing off a little bit and letting time pass. And just trusting that God has this and it's going to work out. Whenever I start feeling a little shaky, a little anxious, just remembering, all right, I trusted God the time before and that worked, so he's going to work again. Yeah, it's pretty neat watching you on this journey. Because it hasn't, I, like I haven't said, do this, do this, do this. This has all been Brent. This has all been you. And I think that's what makes this so good and makes it a lot easier for you this time because it's you. Mm -hmm. It's your decision. It's not mom and dad's. It's not sister's. It's not mine. It's not Christina's. It's you. Mm -hmm. You've made every decision to work your recovery this time. Yeah, and that's been the biggest difference is I want 
to make those decisions now. And before I, I thought I wanted to make them, but I was, I was okay with other people making them for me, but I wasn't going to fully commit. Normally I would say what have been the biggest challenges, but over the last 120 days for you, what have been your biggest challenges this time? Taking things slow and not jumping back into work has been one of the biggest challenges. Um, trusting that everything is going to work out is always a challenge because I, I want to control it. I want to go back and play God and control what's going on. I want this and I want it now. And just learning to let go of that control and kind of let where I'm living kind of help me out for once. That, that's been a challenge, I would say. And um, yeah, I would just say letting go of control over everything is the biggest challenge. Because I like control. I like to do what Brent wants to do. <laughs> You're a lawyer, graduated college. Um, do you have a car right now? Walk us through, I, I mean, how old are you? 29? Turning 29 in August, yeah. Yeah, 29 years old. I mean, you have a car, but do you have it with you? No, sir, I do not. And that that's a, that's a hard, that would, that used to be a very hard thing for me is whenever I couldn't drive someplace that I wanted to go to. Because my parents were, and for good reason, they were very controlling over what I could do with my car because I had a track record of drinking and driving. And that's not going to get me anywhere but dead or in prison yeah um it's just it's wild you've lived a good life you have good examples your mom and dad are still married dad has a good successful job mom is a wonderful mom and and has a successful job three great sisters that that pour into you and have always so you were raised in a really good family mm -hmm. yes Lawyer, graduated college, but no car, no access to a car right now. Mm -mm. So has that helped, do you think? Yeah, it's definitely helped. It's definitely made me, I think, just focus more on my recovery and take things slow. Slower is faster. And I know once I get that car, things I, I tend to kind of get in trouble a little bit. And uh, just kind of humbling myself and knowing that I have to make sacrifices sometimes. And because I don't have a car doesn't mean I'm some deadbeat, some screw up. Right. But that's what people think a lot of times. Oh, yeah, definitely. But here you go. You got a lawyer sitting across, a successful guy, successful family. But he don't have access to a car and he's OK. He's OK. I think a lot of those things mess us up early in recovery. Mm -hmm. Jobs, worrying about a job, worrying about a woman, and we talk about it quite often on here, two things that ruin sobriety quickly, um, relationships and, and money. And then if I would have had a car at the beginning of my sobriety, I would not have stayed sober, I don't think, because mm -hmm. I would have had it. But did you hear them slow is fast? I like it, but they're missing a key part. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Right. I sent them. I sent them the the T-shirt that I have that says as slow as you know, uh, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Mm -hmm. They talk about it when shooting. They talk about it when playing disc golf. Or it actually came from the Navy back on ships when they would not always settle really well. Mm. That's where it started. But yeah, slow is smooth, smooth is fast. Nice. So what? Uh, what kind of pe what kind of people? Professionals? You know. Family, what that, that's been backing you up the most throughout this recovery process? What they've been doing for you? I mean, I have had a lot of people in my corner this whole entire time. And that, my biggest problem was I wasn't using them. And I refused to use them <laughs> up until now. I, I didn't want the help. Um, they were offering it, but I didn't want it. Uh, so, I mean, I have a sponsor, Shane. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh Derek, yeah. You... Say, does everybody in this room share the same sponsor? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the ones at this table, yes. Uh Derek, Derek used to be my sponsor, um, but I was not a good sponsee. At that point in time I did not want it. But I mean he's still someone who if I know 
if I had to turn to somebody, I could easily turn to Derek. So I would consider him someone who's backing me. I mean, I know I can go to him and talk recovery about just about anything with him now that I'm willing to talk. Um, I, I see a therapist once a week, uh, Christina, Shane's wife. I've been doing that for a all while. All in the family. Yeah. <laughs> um, kind of. We should mention also that we're all part of a certain program, too. Yeah. Yeah, really is, is you're connected with Reclaiming Hope, I guess. Is, yeah. Um, yeah. Learn to Live, Reclaiming Hope, two organizations really pouring into Brent. Mm -hmm. um, Brent would not be where he's at. I mean, Learn to Live is amazing. Oh, yeah. Matt and the crew out there, just they do amazing work. And there's good bratwurst out there in Herman. <laughs> yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, but uh, Learn to Live has been a huge help, Reclaiming Hope. And then my family has been there, and they've been there the entire time, no matter what. And it's just unconditional that they're there for me. And like I said, I've been tr I tried so hard to make them not be there for me just because I thought that would be easier for them. Because it's hard on somebody when you see someone you love continue to go down the path that you know is not right for them, and they're just not getting it. And my parents never gave up on me. My fa my sisters never gave up on me, and they they've just been supporting me the entire time. Mm. Uh, well, yeah. So you brought up how addiction affected you, and you keeping your distance from them, and that how's it, your recovery been doing with your relationships? I think my recovery has helped my relationships tremendously and I'm more honest for once and they don't really, they, my family doesn't get to see it and Shane doesn't always get to see it and Christina may not get to see it as much as they used to whenever I was living with them. But the time that you do get to spend with me, I think that they can see a change and it's just been good to be a son again and be a brother again because for, for so long I think all they were was worried about me they never really could have a ca like a ca casual conversation with me without worrying is he, is he drinking or why does he smell like alcohol or is he slurring his words is he talking too much is he not talking enough and not having to worry about that anymore I think is a big weight off of everybody's shoulders and it's just been good to be probably sisters again and mom and dad again. And that that's helped tremendously. I'm trying to log into my Facebook cause I have a message. You could ask a couple more. You uh, know, I don't grab my phone. That's what I'm looking at. You he's, like, what are you like, doing over there? I'll give people trouble for grabbing the phone, <laughs> but I have a message that I, I want right. to read. That's very cool. So uh, what kind of higher power relationships do you have and how has that changed over time? So I believe, you do have a higher power, right? You do, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I have a higher power, and my higher power is God. Um, and I would say, like I said, I always grew up in church. Um, Turn to celebrate recovery because I always went to church and nothing was working, and I knew about celebrate recovery just from seeing Shane up on stage. And I mean, I I turned to it, but I didn't have a great relationship with God at that point in time during addiction. And I can only speak for myself, but I, I'm sure not a lot of people do during addiction. Because all I wanted was, what could God do for me? And so the only time I was praying was, God, can you please help me with this? Or can you get me this job? Can you help me do better on this test? And I don't know if God was helping me at that time or not, but I certainly wasn't thanking him for it after it was done and over with. I was cursing him whenever I was down bad and blaming him. Why would you be doing this to me, God? And now my relationship with God is great. I'm not going to say that I have an awesome prayer life, but if I can do two things a day and that's I wake up and I say, God, please help me just stay sober today and just help me with whatever I face. And then even if I'm dog tired at the end of the night, just mumble quick hey thank you god i appreciate that today thank you for another day yeah buddy <clears throat> so what has what's been the biggest tools that have helped you stay sober 
what are your coping skills? What are the tools that you utilize on a daily basis? On a daily basis is, I would say, those two, those two prayers help me a lot. And they're, they're usually more than that. Don't get me wrong. I, I, I bet do, they are. <laughs> I, do, I do pray more. And I can utilize prayer. That is one thing great about having a higher power is I can utilize that throughout the day. I mean, I'm feeling anxious during the day. I can just say a quick prayer. I'm going into a meeting. I run to the bathroom real quick. And I can say a prayer. That's, that's a big coping mechanism for me. Um, journaling. Uh, <laughs> there it goes. There it is. Journaling. I am a huge journaler, and I absolutely love it now. I mean, I would say it, it didn't take much for me to start doing it. I've always loved writing, and and I love being creative with the journal prompts and just kind of doing my own thing. Probably spent way too much money on pens. Anytime Christina tells me about some new journal she's got, I'm ordering off of Amazon. Journaling has been a huge one. I journal every day in the morning, and then at night I do a quick little check-in that Christina's taught me to do called Thanos. So you go through your feelings, um, give yourself an affirmation, write down one need that you, to have, that you may have throughout the day. You own up to something that you've done, and then you write down one thing that you struggle with throughout the day and sometimes i switch it up and say one thing that i've been successful with throughout the day oh nice yeah, just, i, I like that, that one out like that a little curveball in. there yeah. you go well yeah. i here like a four step keep it keep it balanced right mm -hmm. i don't always have to write something that i struggle with i love the success even if you I write do. a struggle why can't we write a success with mm -hmm. it maybe make it a fan oh sis. yeah 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 you can just i mean you can really do whatever works for you and that's what's been great i mean that's all I do. I, I try to meditate, but I'm not very good at it. But I try to get the Calm app, or I have some app that I paid a year for, so I should probably use it more. Um, yeah. You got another pin for that. What? I said you could have got another pin yeah, for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I definitely could have. I don't think I've logged on in a while. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> um, so what strengths, what qualities have you developed during your recovery journey um, that you're most proud of? I'm most proud of? I would say... The biggest thing that I've done, I don't know if it would, I guess it would be considered a strength as humility. I, I've deflated my ego and pride and finally have that, um, that strength to speak up and say something if something is going wrong with me. I would say that's something that I've developed. Honesty. Mm. Um, finally got honest with people around me, got honest with myself. Um, resiliency would be the last one that I'm proud of. I haven't given up this whole entire time and I'm glad I haven't because this, my last four months have been great and I wouldn't have had that if I would have given up a long time ago. I would say your family would not have let you have given up. They, yeah. they would have, they would have drug him kicking and screaming. Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> Without they would have kept dragging you, and, and we, would have, we would keep showing up at your house, you know, until you, we were going to love you until you wanted to love you. Yes, and you told me that a long time ago, and I didn't believe it, and <laughs> I, I, th I think I finally believe it. Good, because um, we do, we do love you, that's for sure. Go ahead. So what is, like, big, biggest surprise in your recovery, man? In the last four months, what has been your biggest surprise? Man, I would say, I think a lot of people would say how fun sobriety can be. But, you know, I would want to say that my biggest surprise is just how little other people care who aren't in recovery when they see me not drinking. That was always a big, big worry of mine is like, what are people going to think that I'm not drinking or like what are people gonna say that i've been gone for work for so long people don't care and it's made it so much easier to just tell someone yeah i don't drink anymore and if i'm close enough to them i'll tell them yeah, i don't drink anymore i'm in recovery and then just say hey that's awesome man and they don't they don't say like oh really why what happened why why did you decide not to drink anymore did this go did this go wrong? What happened? Can't you, you could just drink once. No, people really don't say those things to you. And that's been the biggest surprise. I would say 
Because I think people are kind of letting go of that stigma behind recovery. So what are your plans for the future? <sighs> Not the future trip, but just what are your plans for the future and how do you plan to maintain your recovery? I mean, I'm, I'm taking it slow. I'm going to spend... I'm, I've put no real time limit on my time at Learn to Live now that I've kind of given in to that one. Um, hey, man, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> so just keep doing that and uh, working at this recovery and living this recovery and not just making this some um, fad that's going on in my life and continuing to grow in my faith, continuing to take the advice of other people. And I love my job. I love my career. It's something that I really am passionate about, and it's it's been great having it now that I'm sober and actually focused. And so I'm really excited to see where that can take me. But I'm also really excited to see what I can do with recovery because I do love being around the people in recovery, and I love seeing everything that my people are doing, like Shane and Christina are doing with Reclaiming Hope, and I, I kind of want to be a part of that and see what I can do to help with that. And, you know, just just enjoying life, letting go and letting God. Right on, man. So uh, a message of hope. What do you have for that, per- that, that listener out there that's new to their recovery? What, what's that message of hope that you have for them? Stick with it. And not just only to stick with it, but... It gets better. It may not seem like it immediately gets better, but it really does. You're going to have your ups and downs. And I wish someone would have told me that at the beginning, that just because you get sober doesn't mean everything is going to be great, but it's going to be a lot better than it was before. And just keep pushing through maybe that hard hour that you have and don't let it ruin your day. Because just because you have a bad moment does not mean you have to have a bad day. Yes. I love that part. <laughs> Brent, we love you, brother. We're so glad that, you're, that you came on uh, willing to share. Yeah. I can't wait to have him on a couple more times as the journey goes. And don't worry, we already got plans for you. <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> don't, don't worry about that, brother. We got plans for you. But thank you for being here. Yeah, thank you for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Oh, glad you're here, man. Yeah, we never stop loving you. You know, you ain't talked to me since the last time I seen you in uh, Kirkwood. I ain't to stop loving you, brother. You know that. <laughs> hey, look, none of us heard from him for a while. <laughs> when he went on that two-week blackout, man, he made me nervous. I, I, I'm asking Brian, have you guys heard from him? Nope. All right, well, then I found out that he Obviously, if mom and dad ain't heard, something's up. We, <laughs> we need to go find him. <laughs> Hey, look, all of us are proud of you. I have a message I was going to read from your sister, but we'll skip it. We'll save it for later. Um, Even your sister reached out. I mean, the love and support that you have as a family is unbelievable. But I'm proud of you. I know everybody that knows you is proud of you and the journey that you've been on. And I can't wait to see what God's going to do in and through you next, brother. Thank you, brother. Now, for the rest of you, we love you as well. Um, send us an email. Let us know what you thought about Brent. But um, also, we'd like to just hear a little bit of your story because maybe bring you on here and hammer yes. out some of these questions as well. So have a good week. God bless you guys. and We'll see you soon. Yep. And don't forget to check us out. Every podcast platform, we are there. All right. You guys have a great night. Steve? Yeah. There it is. Hit us, We're out of here, guys. Thank you once again for joining us. Look at it, Steve. No headset, no nothing, and he's just right on. Oh.